and we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the stream. I, I hope you are well. Uh, I'm very happy to, 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 to be back tonight for, for with an interview with a, a new member of the European Parliament. We, we have taken a, a bit of a break from interviews of, over the last couple of weeks, uh, but now we, we're getting back to it uh, and we're getting back to it strong. Uh, so tonight we will discuss with Austrian MEP Thomas Weitz from the Greens Group, so on the left side of European politics. Uh, he is 47 years old and he has been an MEP since 2017, so that means that he, he joined the Parliament in the middle of the previous mandate, probably to, to replace someone. Uh, then he was re-elected in uh, 2019, but he couldn't take his seat in Parliament before 2020 because he was what we called back then a Brexit MEP, uh, which were the, the MEPs from ar around the uh, European Union that could not take the, get their seat in the Parliament uh, as long as the British MEPs uh, were still there. So they, they could only take their seat after Brexit. So that's why we call them Brexit MEP. And since February uh, 2020, he, he is now back in Parliament with, uh, with all of us. So. He uh, now sits in the Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Committee on, Peti on Petition, and the Committee of Inquiry on the Protection of Animals During Transport. He is also a substitute member in the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development and the Subcommittee on Security and Defense. But, uh, as usual, before we start our conversation, I, remi I remind you the house rules for anyone who is new with us tonight. So, our guest will be with us for about an hour. After that, uh, he will leave and enjoy the rest of, of his evening while I will keep streaming for half an hour to discuss with you all about uh, what you thought about the interview, uh, my own interpretation of things, uh, other things that might need additional explanations, etc, etc. Uh, as usual, I prepared my own questions uh, for Mr. Weitz and I collect a question from people on Reddit and Discord. You can also ask your questions uh, via the chat. Uh, I will keep an eye on it and pick among your suggestions. So feel free to participate and react, but don't spam and stay civil. Uh, the goal of these MEP interviews is for you to understand better what is the job of an MEP, uh, who is Mr. Vice in this uh, tonight, and what are his priorities, maybe some of his opinion on general EU political questions. Uh, I try to invite a variety of MEPs so that they may share their own opinions that you and I may share or not. Uh, we may agree with them or not, uh, but that's not the point. The, the aim is for you to see the diversity that exists in the European Union and build your own opinions, Why my own role is to facilitate the discussion without taking a stand on the substance. So we will not go deep into uh, policy discussion and we will not touch uh, on national politics unless it is relevant to EU politics. So keep that in mind uh, when asking your questions. So without further ado, let's do this. So, uh, good evening and welcome to you, uh, Thomas Weitz. Uh, thank you again for, for accepting to, to do this interview on my channel. Uh, you heard me explain it to our viewers. Uh, the goal of tonight is to put faces on the European Union and help people understand better what is happening in Brussels. Uh, so tonight, we will get to know you better and try to understand what you actually do and what you stand for and what you think about the EU. Uh, so perhaps, perhaps to, to start off our, our discussion, could you uh, briefly introduce yourself to, to, the, to the audience and we'll pick up from there. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Thomas Waits and by profession I'm an organic farmer and uh, organic beekeeper and permaculture forester, uh, a mountain farmer in the south of Austria, uh, half in Slovenia, so I also pay taxes to Slovenia and I am I was joining the Greens uh, in the late 90s uh, on anti-GMO movement. I'm very much coming from the NGO sector. I did a lot of education, event planning, campaigning, uh, but also a lot of political work on agriculture, environment, animal welfare and all of this. Uh, originally, I was politicized more in the left uh, as a youngster or some may call it radical left, uh, which uh, still has some um, has remained uh, 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 as a part of my political identity. Uh, and now I'm in the European Parliament since uh, 2019, again elected uh, since 2020, as you mentioned already after Brexit, I joined the Parliament and uh, you mentioned already the committees I'm working on, but as I'm also one of the two co-chairs of European Green Party, uh, I work actually to 
all European, uh, not only European policies. Uh, so just ask whatever you would like to ask and I will try to give answers uh, if I can. Perfect. That's that's exactly what we're here for tonight. So you actually anticipated uh, my, my first question. I was going to ask you about how you came up into politics and later became of any, uh, of any people, but you already answered that. So if I understand well, uh, you you came from from the trenches, from the ground, uh, from the uh, from the mobilization through NGOs. That's a that's a, a bit your your how you got into politics and later on how you became a, uh, an MP. But uh, my, then I will modify a bit my question. Um, since you you come from the uh, from the ground from uh, from uh, from the trenches of uh, social mobilization etc and we know that there is usually a big mistrust in ngos and uh, in the old in this world towards politicians and how did you overcome this mistrust and decide okay to change something i have to go in there well as, as long as you work with an ngo you can uh, actually stick to the topic that is close to your heart uh, you can raise a lot of public attention you can actually influence politics sometimes more than you expect but at the end of the day to really bring change uh, uh, to the world and, and to the ground uh, you need to enter decision making processes and uh, at a certain point uh, you need to take over responsibility and uh, uh, tackle and, and counter the, the recent political forces which are what I thought going into the wrong direction with our societies and especially with our environment uh, so, so I, I started to be engaged and uh, within the party, but also as an elected member of different levels of parliaments. And uh, uh, I, I found out that I can combine that very well. I, I stayed an NGO person in a way because a lot of my work that I do is very closely linked with the NGO sector. And sometimes that's obvious, but sometimes you don't see that because that only happens in the background. Okay, interesting. Uh, and now that you're so now you're 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 an MEP, you're, you're back in the parliament. Uh, so I mentioned all the committees you you are part uh, part of, and uh, the uh, in practice we know that MEPs are often very specialized. So what are what are the topics you on which you usually work uh, on the day to day basis? Well, politically, I grew a lot also in all the agricultural sector and everything that is linked to agriculture, like uh, energy questions, uh, animal welfare questions, uh, soil questions, water questions, uh, um, organic agriculture stuff. Uh, but that's not it, it doesn't it didn't happen because this was my only priority as a politician but uh, there was just an urgent need also within the austrian greens where where my engagement grew uh, because there were very few people representing the farming sector uh, and understanding the language of of the rural community and and being able to actually address rural community with green topics and so uh, that very much grew into a political profile for me um i i also did a lot of foreign policy uh, on different levels before, very much also with foundation, uh, education programs, workshops, events, plannings, and so on, especially towards the Western Balkans, but also Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Georgia, and like these neighboring countries to the east. Uh, and also, I focused very much uh, in my whole life already on, on uh, supporting uh, progressive, green-minded, modern movements in the former Eastern European countries. Uh, as a typical Austrian, I have a Slovenian grand-grandfather and a Bohemian grandmother and a Hungarian grandfather, so typical Southeast Austrian. So I have a lot of family relations to these uh, regions. And as I'm 47, I have also witnessed uh, the Iron Curtain, I've <laughs> witnessed the communist time in these countries so I know very well still from my own experience how that looked like and so I'm, I'm very supportive of these societies becoming um, like let's say modern European uh, societies based on values and rule of law and all of this uh, but uh, my, my basic uh, political engagement goes further I'm, I'm called a generalist uh, maybe that's also the reason why uh, I was I was elected as the co-chair of European Green Party uh, because I'm I'm kind of not stuck into my silo, but uh, always trying to link uh, the special topics I'm working on or link the different political spheres to each other and actually talk about the bigger picture, the interlinkages of the different political topics and, and uh, like the biggest system. Yeah, trying to make it a, a coherent all, uh, so, so to say. Uh, I see uh, our first question uh, in chat from Little Miss Derry. Uh, so 
she is interested in knowing about how much your, your opinion about political work uh, has changed since you became an MEP compared to, to an exterior point of view that you may have had when you were working before in an NGO. Uh, well, yeah, what, what became even clearer to me than it was before is that the actual political work uh, does not um, need to be or very often is not linked to the communication or the other way around communication is not so much linked to the actual political work so uh, and, and we can regret that and I do certainly regret that but it's just part of our political reality so if I want to do communications I need to frame messages completely different than when I go to a, to a, to a committee negotiating a concrete lawmaking procedure uh, with my colleagues so that's like like two parts of my political life and sometimes that's linked to each other but sometimes it's completely decoupled and in, in that intensity uh, that was a pretty new experience for me also uh, within the european parliament how much that can be decoupled mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean, because uh, yeah, the, the, the Parliament, especially the European Parliament, is a very technical place. You go deep into the details and it's always uh, MPs often find it very difficult for to then translate what they do in Parliament into, uh, well, something that the average citizen can understand and can relate to to uh, his everyday life because to so, especially in some areas i, I would say in, uh, in agricultural policy less so but in in some other area what you're doing you so you're working at such a meta level that it becomes like es esoterical for for the uh, for for the common citizen so it's always a, a bit of a struggle but uh so you've been talking about uh, uh political objectives uh as a as a MEP, as a politician as a green etc uh if you could you tell us like what are you your top top three uh, i'm saying three it can be one it can be two it can be whatever you want but uh, the, let's say three political objectives what you would want to achieve policy wise uh, as part of your of your mandate of a, as an mep well, I try to contribute as much as possible to actually change the whole agricultural model that we have in Europe, uh, which is a devastating one that we have now, uh, fueled with billions of taxpayers' money. So it's actually every single citizen of the European Union financing a destructive system that destroys the fundament of our food production and that is oriented on short-term profits uh, and not oriented on long-term productivity. And also the agricultural sector today is a main contributor on, on uh, climate uh, uh, warming, uh, global warming and, and climate crisis, uh, emitting a lot of uh, methane, CO2 and so on. Uh, and it could be, if you uh, apply the right practices, it could be actually part of the solution in sequestering huge amounts of CO2 back into the soil. And we're really missing out an opportunity there. Uh, but the lobby activity on that field is just enormous. Uh, and, and there, I mean, I, I, I fight my battles every single day and uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to be a bit satisfied with the little wins, even though uh, the big picture is only changing very slowly and it's a very tough battle. OK, uh, second priority maybe is uh, uh, to keep European values, rule of law, uh, democracy, you know, all that that authoritarian uh, tendencies that we see in, in Hungary, in Poland, in Bulgaria, uh, like to put a real stop on that, uh, uh, because I mean, that's that's tearing us apart that's creating division uh, that is that is fueling hatred between between people and this is just what has brought us into two world wars or or even the balkan wars were exactly fueled with this kind of ideology uh, and i i really tried to do my best to defend european values and european also rule of law uh, uh, and an independent justice and media freedom as much as i can across the union Okay, uh, that, that's pretty clear. Uh, I have another question from Tubo Kappa in chat, but that relates more to foreign policy. So since we are go we're going to dive a, a bit on agriculture, I'm going to reserve that question. I I've seen it, Tubo Kappa, but I'm going to cover it in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but I I've seen it and we're going to answer it in a few minutes. So uh, since we are on agriculture, uh, so that's that was the perfect transition to the question I already prepared. Um, so as you 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 uh, you said, uh, agriculture is a topic in which divisions and controversies are often intense, and especially when it's uh, it's taken in combination with the environment uh, policy. Uh, and one campaign that has been very vocal over the the, the last few months uh, and 
I would say rather radical to an extent, uh, is about asking the withdrawal of the common agricultural policy. So for the viewers, uh, the ag common agricultural policy is basically uh, the EU money that goes to the agricultural sector, to farming, and which represents more or less 30% of the overall EU budget. So the Basically, the campaigners the, the, behind this initiative accuse the current budget, uh, agricultural budget, of not being environment friendly enough, and so that the only solution is to kill it and start again from scratch. So, where do you stand in this debate, in this controversy? I exactly support that campaign. Uh, that proposal was still built uh, from Hogan, Commissioner Hogan in the last term, uh, and it's it's not reflecting uh, the new policies around the Green Deals, which, which uh, tries to uh, push Europe uh, towards a transition uh, to CO2 neutral economy. Uh, and, and it's not in line with the farm to fork strategy. Farm to fork strategy is a strategy of the commission that aims to reduce pesticides, to reduce artificial fertilizer, to reiterate uh, local food chains, local food production, local value chains. Uh, and, and this is just going exactly opposite on what we're still financing with the cap money. Uh, and, and so it's not reflecting the, the, the policies of the new commission at all. It's even in clear contrast contradiction to the new policies. And I really wonder that industry is playing along with that because industry is asked to, to invest a lot in, into the transition of their production models. Uh, transport is, 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 is uh, asked to, to invest huge amounts uh, of money into the transition, into rail, into uh, alternative uh, motor, motors and so on. And they, that they accept that the agricultural sector is still allowed, no, not just allowed, but supported with billions of, of taxpayers' money to actually increase the damage on biodiversity and increase the damage on climate and even does not deliver on healthy food, rather the opposite. A lot of the food that we get has remains of pesticides. It's full of, of, of industrialized uh, substances, aromas, uh, uh, additives of all kinds. Uh, and, and so it's even causing another damage on the health sector. Uh, and, and so from, an, from a socioeconomic perspective, uh, it's, a, it's a complete failure. And to, to try to negotiate some kind of green green fig leaves uh, into that old structured cap, which is basically spreading the money over the landscape, uh, cannot work. And, and also the second problem is that, that, I mean, you get the money for the hectares you have. And that actually uh, leads to EU taxpayers' money being poured into the pockets of the very wealthy ones, international investors, oligarchs, like the 10 best friends of Mr. Orban and so on. So we're actually fueling the decrease of, of, of real farmers, as I say, in the countryside. They can't sustain their businesses anymore, but they're the more sustainable ones. They're the ones that offer more workplaces. They are the ones that are working closer to nature and closer to their fellow citizens in the countryside and in the cities. And they're, they're closing their farms. In a, and there's, we're losing farms across Europe in a rapid manner. And then they sell this as basic income support for farmers. Come on, you know, the, uh, Mr. Babish, he's the prime minister of Czech Republic, is getting 45 to 55 million euros per year for his agriculture. What well, agriculture, it's industry. And, and there is, it, we, it's not possible to stop that. Uh, even the parliament had a majority to limit the contributions from CAP to 100,000 euros per holding or per farm, but there's so much resistance from some of the most corrupted uh, um, prime ministers uh, uh, across Europe that I really feel that not even that will make its way through. And then if you talk about, uh, let's say, workers' rights of agriculture workers, what we see in Spain, you know, that's close to slavery, yeah? uh, that, you know, migrants getting abused by, by the industry and then pouring cheap uh, products over the European market from a human rights perspective, this is just ridiculous. And we're still funding these kinds of 
enterprises with millions and millions of taxpayers' money. And that just needs to stop. We need a 180 degree turn on agriculture policy. Everything else is neither coherent nor fit for the future. Okay, uh, I got a couple of questions on agricultural policy uh, in the chat. So first one from, from interim is Derry again. Um, so a question is, farmers says that they do not have the tools to be more sustainable. What is, your, what is in your opinion, uh, the tools available for the farmers? Come on, who is saying that? I mean, I'm a farmer myself. I know my farmer's community. I mean, most of these people are well educated today. Uh, let's, let's, I, I give you an example. Huh? Uh, we, we're talking a lot about herbicide use, about glyphosate and so on. Every single crop farmer in the European Union knows how to do weeding in a technical, with technical uh, machinery. Every single farmer knows how to do that. But it's just, you know, it's not supported by the, by, uh, not supported enough by the, by the um, agriculture fundings. And it's a bit more work on the field. And, and the prices that the farming sector is getting for their produce is so low that farmers are so much under economical pressure that many of them try to do their very best to spare every single euro. I don't know who from the audience here knows what a farmer gets for a kilo of corn or for a kilo of wheat. A kilo of corn costs eight cents. That's what the farmer gets or for an egg, you know, even a non-cage produced egg, guess it's 10 cent or 12 cent per egg. That's what the farmer gets. And because the industry, the big industry uh, is, is dumping the prices uh, and, and also importation into the European Union that is not meeting any of our standards is creating a huge pressure on the prices, the global market system. And you know what? Cap money was in the first round in the 50s, it was there to provide Europeans with food. Yes. But since the 70s or 80s, it's only there to make European agriculture fit for competition, competition on the world markets, which is by nature impossible because we have higher labor costs, we have higher environmental standards, animal welfare standards. We cannot produce for world market prices. And that's why we need your taxpayers' money to be to pay the farmers. And farmers are living mostly from subsidies. They are not earning on their produce. Yeah? And just to keep the farmers alive, your tax money is taken that some huge companies, multinational companies can make their revenues on the world market. It's a big cheat. All right. Next question from the chat from Andrews London. Uh, so could you ask what Mr. Verts thinks about the modern agricultural techniques applied in the Netherlands? I have no idea what these techniques are, but uh, is it something you approve of as an example to follow or are you against it? So I don't know if you know about the techniques he's talking about or whether... I have some ideas on that. Well, uh, look... Precision farming, modern farming methods. Um, it, it, there's no clear yes or no. Yeah? There's useful ideas. There's useful techniques to be used. Uh, but I mean, if you talk about the the tomato production in in the Netherlands, I mean, look at that. Uh, it's so it's based on chemical produce. So like the, the plants are not growing in earth, they're fed with, with chemical substances. You can see the tanks outside of these plants. Uh, you have a tank for the fertilizer and you have three or four or five tanks for the pesticides. Uh, so so in, 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 in many cases, uh, there's a huge energy need also to produce tomatoes in the Netherlands, you know? I mean, you, you need to provide them with light, you need to heat the, the, the greenhouses. Uh, and if you sum that all up, and if you would actually price the CO2 emissions of that kind of production, it would be not worth it. And tomatoes would be again produced in Italy or Spain. I mean, we have in the European Union, a lot of thousand countries that can produce tomatoes also outside. But, you know, also, I mean, modern technologies can play a part of the solution. As we see like many urban farming projects, yeah, where you grow mushrooms in the cellar with, with the remains of coffee, coffee brewing. Yeah? clever ideas yeah where you link fish production of catfish uh, with greenhouses where the, the the manure of the catfish actually feeds the plants and the plants enrich the the water with with small small animals and and substances that the catfish can again eat and you have a kind of a circular uh, production 
very useful, good idea, yeah? and also precision farming, you know, uh, well, it makes sense to have, uh, as an example, a weeding machine that can, with artificial intelligence, with a cell phone, actually weed in the row one centimeter next to the row, and it can even detect different kind of plants next to each other. So you can have mixed cultures, which actually are much more stable in terms of drought, in terms of uh, uh, pests or insects. Yeah? But then so, again, I mean, then, then yeah. again, I'm just connecting that to, to what you, to the question of before. I mean, these uh, arguably high tech uh, tools, they, they must be very expensive. So how, how can a small farmer afford that if he's not uh, supported? It's a good question, but again, not all of these techniques are super expensive. The one I just described is 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 a very cheap one. Every little farmer, every yeah, a medium farmer can afford that because everyone has got a cell phone. It's just an app you put on the cell phone and uh, you link it to your to your tracker. With it's, it's a box, so you can even do it with an old tracker uh, because the trackers are they're actually able to manipulate the weeding machine okay. in the back. Yeah, so so that's possible. You know, there there is clever solutions but yes indeed i mean what do we see as precision farming this is a complete package from Bayer. Uh, Bayer is, is selling you the seeds they're telling you which pesticides to use when they, they're selling you the tracker with the precision farming with satellite data and whatever and who owns the data and the data are the gold of today the data is owned by Bayer. yeah and if you want to change to another company you have to buy the knowledge of your own field uh, and so you see there's a lot of traps yeah uh, so precision farming as such doesn't say too much on the other hand you know there's systems with drones and with uh, uh insects that eat the damaging insects yeah that counter the mm -hmm. damaging insects and the drone releases one of one ball of these helpful insects every 10 meters on your field automatically very useful and the drone is not so expensive anymore yeah so so there is good solutions but there is also solutions which basically serve the industrialization of agriculture and which can only be used by huge companies and not by the medium and small size farming sector so there's useful precision farming but there's also quite some dangers around it and i didn't tackle new genome techniques that would be a, a topic uh, on its own all right uh I have a last question, a last big question on, on agriculture, and I will include uh, remarks from, from, from the chat from intermediary again. Uh, so as, as we have seen, agriculture policy, is, it's a complicated topic uh, because it stands at the, the crossroads between many things that are equally, I would say, of, the, of strategic importance for the EU. So on the one hand, you have the, the, the food, security, food security aspect, so the capacity of Europe to feed itself, which is, as you mentioned, the, the, the origin of the common agricultural, agricultural policy. Uh, you have also, you also mentioned the economic aspects, because Europe is now one of the biggest exporters of agricultural, agricultural products in, in the world. So it's, it's a big market. And then Little Miss Derry was saying that uh, in reaction to what you have said, you were saying before uh, that what, what what is Europe supposed to do? Is it supposed to stop being present on the world market and not training agricultural agricultural products? So that's another aspect. And then you ask, oh, you add the uh, environmental aspect, of course, because farming has an impact on climate change. And you have a, what I would say is a social impact, because which is ensuring that tomorrow we there are still farmers, whether big, small, but also young farmers. So. This is a complicated equation. How, how do you achieve this balance? Um, well, uh, by, by looking closely on, on the different proposals, whether they're useful or not. I mean, you, you mentioned it already. Yeah? There's a big argument from the agri-industry against organic because it has lower yields on a yearly basis, but it can provide yields for hundreds of years. Yeah, It's not destroying the soil it's working on. So on a long perspective, it's much more delivering uh, uh, to, to food security than uh, industrial agriculture can never do but but uh then i mean you also said europe is the biggest agricultural exporter so what do we need to be scared that we can't feed our own people or are we the biggest exporter but also part of that export business is based on what we're buying soy millions of hectares are planted only for european meat production and we bring the soy into europe we stuff it into a uh, uh, chicken and pork 
and, and then we sell the chicken and pork on, 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 on to half of the globe. Yeah, but what stays here is the manure, is the stink, is the nitrate, yeah, is the is the multi-resistant bacteria from from uh, this kind of production uh, are zoonoses as we've seen it now. Yeah, uh, and so so is that really a, 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 a model fit for future? And I really think that we should use European taxpayers' money to pay European farmers to first of all produce healthy food in a sustainable way for European citizens and not for multinational companies to serve the world market. I think that just does not make sense. And then balancing climate and environmental aspects with food production, organic agriculture shows how it works. And it's not, you know, organic agriculture in the 80s was well done by some, some let's say more or less hippie-like people. Yeah, And they tried and they experimented. Today, there's a lot of research research, there's a lot of techniques, there's a lot of knowledge, there's varieties that were bred extra for, for organic agriculture. And it's no problem at all to feed European population and even produce more for extra markets on the world with organic agriculture. So that argument on with food security is it, one that comes very much from the GMO industry as well uh, in the moment again. But it's just, it, if you, it's just not fact-based. So take science, take facts, Start your brain and then you see proper solutions. All right. Uh, so I will close the, the agricultural chapter uh, on this. Uh, even if I see, oh, actually, the question that pops up, I will link it as a transition to the next topic. Uh, so we're talking about a bit foreign affairs now because you're in the foreign affairs committee. Uh, and usually, the, the, the foreign affairs is not a topic that you. That you instantly, uh, instinctively linked to the Greens, uh, especially in the context where we have uh, now very aggressive actors like Russia or China that don't exactly play by the rules. So how as a Green you, you deal with this, with this stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I focus very much on, on also um, peace politics. Because, I mean, you know, security is not just about military activity, it's also about all kinds of measurements that lead to, to, to communication, to actually dialogue, uh, to, to diplomatic uh, uh, efforts. Uh, to conflict prevention, uh, not just waiting until a conflict uh, escalates and then uh, yeah, coming in with an army. Yeah? Uh, most of the conflicts can be, uh, uh, can be prevented from escalation with much cheaper costs uh, uh, beforehand. Uh, and, and so there I see my priorities, but also very much linked to global trade policies uh, and what does that do to, uh, to our, not only the planet, but, but how are we structuring it actually? Is this on eye level? How, is this a fair relation between countries? Uh, and, and, and how is that linked with our foreign policy goals? I'm also working a lot on migration and, and uh, migration and asylum, but a lot on actually reasons for migration and how that is linked with our foreign policy and how many conflicts are linked also with weapon exports from the European Union. So we first uh, uh, kind of attack economies from poorer countries with, with uh, trade agreements that are absolutely unfair uh, and not on high level. So we create uh, uh, economical problems that, that results into conflicts in the country. Then we sell again a lot of weapons. So we again extract money. Then we have the conflict and then we try to do some interventions or maybe uh, uh, we don't even intervene, but we just let them shoot each other. And I think that kind of attitude uh, is creating a lot of problems that fire back from us because we're we're contributing to uh, zooms uh, on the globe that are completely destroyed by civil war uh, and where people leave because there's no ground for living anymore uh, and there's no hope and no perspective so they're leaving uh, searching for a better life for themselves for their kids for their families well and then we see them stranding in in, in libya in in camps or being drowned in the, the mediterranean sea which is completely awkward you know i mean this this should really not happen in the 21st century and it has or directly to do with our kind of foreign policy, foreign relations that we have uh, on many levels. So you see, this is more or less the, the, the topical um, uh, kind of framework mm -hmm. why yeah, I the, the, the green uh, approach, the, I see. Not I just see. Uh, effort, but also security. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, speaking of security, so I'm, I'm coming back to the question that Tubo Kappa asked uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, the question is, what do you think about the creation of an EU army? Do you think that it could realistically happen, taking in mind the differences in foreign policy between the member states? Yeah, that's a very difficult question for me because uh, I mean, I'm, I'm by, by my political nature, I'm a pacifist. Huh? Mm. So, so it, 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 it's generally not something I will give a bit shout out for, uh, let's create an army. Huh? Mm. Uh, but I mean, I'm a realist as well. And I'm, I'm a pr pragmatic enough to know that we need that kind of infrastructure as well uh, to even to push through some peace policy sometimes. Yeah, uh, But a European army, well, uh, you know, we have PESCO. Yeah? PESCO, this is like a try to try to actually um, uh, unite some forces and try to link them to each other and, and make them effective. And if you only see the numbers, what all the European countries, all the single countries are spending on military expenditures. And every single country has the whole row, the whole, the whole sector from tanks to planes to canoes yeah? and the whole structure of command and everything. And if you sum it up, and this is a huge waste of money across the European Union, and it's not even very effective. Look, the European Union was not even able to stop the Balkan Wars, which were next door. We needed the US Americans to, to bomb uh, 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 Belgrade to stop that war. Yeah? So we're, we're, we're just wasting huge amounts of taxpayers' money, and we don't even have the proclaimed security or, or ability to actually intervene in a moment where, well, we've seen concentration camps uh, where people were killed like hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of them. Yeah? So, so uh, at the end of the day, well, um, I think it would, I would not oppose a project of a real European United Forces if we spare half or two thirds of the money spent on military and we use the money for education or for healthcare or for social security or whatsoever, yeah? but just don't waste it for the military sector. And the fact that we're now opening up EU budget for the defense fund, financing directly the, the military block, you know, that industry, in, 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 I think that's the wrong path that we're going. If we look into European army or something comparable, it must reduce the overall spending uh, across Europe and not increase it. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, a more political aspect to things, more like meta level, not policy. Um, so, uh, Political groups in the European Union, in the European Parliament, uh, sorry, so in your case the Greens, uh, are composed of a lot of different national delegations, so each delega national delegation with its own specificities, including when it comes to political opinion. So you are Austrian and Green, so one could expect that there are strong similarities uh, between uh, for, for cultural reasons, between the Austrian Greens and the German Greens. The German Greens being a very strong force within the Green Group in the European Parliament. But are Austrian Greens fully aligned with the German Greens, or are there topics on which you don't necessarily agree with, uh, agree with your Green colleagues? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, the whole Green Group in the Parliament uh, is, is the most coherent group uh, of all political families in the European Parliament. So that means we, most of the time, in 98% of the cases, we all vote the same, uh, uh, in the same direction, and we, we cast the same votes. So we're quite coherent within the Green sector. Well, you know, German Greens and Austrian Greens, ask me if the Greens in Baden-Württemberg are the same as the Greens in Berlin. No, they are not. Yeah? Uh, within the Greens, we have quite a spectrum uh, coming from even far left, I would say, down all the road into the center and even center conservative forces, like you see Mr. Kretschmann uh, in, in Baden-Württemberg. But there's like, there's some differences there, yeah? Uh, but like the key issues that we're standing for, the key battles that we're fighting, we're very, very united. And it's, 
it's very rare that we really disagree on topics. We had some disagreements on, on uh, data protection and, and, you know, all these upload filter stories. And there were some greens that were more on the side of artists and there were other greens that were more on the side of free internet uh, in any case. But, you know, it's, it's really only very minor issues where we different where we differ from each other so we're, we're quite in one line and even if that may surprise you historically austrian greens are at the left of german greens even though we're in that kind of crazy coalition okay oh, interesting well even if i mean i'm not surprised to an extent because indeed uh, the, the greens are like you said were among the most coherent force in the in the european parliament but probably Definitely in the in the top three uh, when when it, when it comes to uh, to, to that, but uh, so it's not surprising. But uh, okay, I didn't know that the, the 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 Austrian Greens were on the left side to the uh, compared to the, the German. But that's that's interesting. Um, I'm coming back also something to say. You said at the at the beginning of the stream on on your own experience. You you said that when you arrived in in the, in the Austrian Greens, you were among the few people in the Greens that had a farming background, knew how to speak to, uh, to, to farmers, etc, etc. How, how did you get the Greens to, to, to get into uh, a sector, to talk to people that, well, are not their natural allies, so to say? Well, I mean, Austrian Greens are, are a Green Party that is relatively strong for quite a while already, for 20, 25 years. Uh, and uh, and it, it, as all the Green Parties across the European Union, they originally stem from a very urban movement very knowledge driven, academics driven, uh, um, uh, rarely any workers, rarely any farmers. But if you want to actually extend your voter space on a certain moment, you have to look into that part of society. Of and in fact, if you see the proposals that Greens do uh, uh, on, on, on policy and on lawmaking, they're, they're in many times much more social than social democrats. Uh, and, but people just don't realize because nobody talks to them. And uh, if you want to talk to workers, and my father was a rail worker, you know, my mother is from the countryside. So I didn't grow up in a wealthy environment. I'm also not an academic. Yeah? Uh, so if, if you want to talk to, to that part of society, you'd rather find people that know that society from within and that are able to formulate a message and formulate green political uh, um, demands in a way that this can be understood. Because if you start with a very academic description of what you want to try to explain, and you have a lot of uh, Latin words in it and so on, within seconds, you know, the, the, the perception of, of workers- Yeah, and, you lost and everyone. Actually closing. And, mm -hmm. and that's 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 something where Greens really have to look into, integrate uh, more workers, more farmers, more bottom-up people. And does that lead to, to, to difficult discussion where you, are, you have some time to, uh, to manage the expectation of people who are more academic to tell you, well, in reality on the ground, what you're saying would not work or that would not be acceptable for farmers or you need to tweak this or that? Uh, or is this still like a, that there are no, it doesn't cause any clash, so to say? Uh, no, I mean, I, for me, it doesn't cause any clash. I, I, I mean, I, I know universities only as a as a speaker, yeah, from mm. inside. Uh, but I like to go on universities, and I, I'm perfectly fit to also enter an academic discussion, uh, because you know, I'm, I'm I'm working on knowledge base and on of science course. base, and I, I read a lot and I studied a lot, even though I have no certificates for that. Uh, but and and it's also a question to know your audience, yeah. Uh, and when I go to a university, well, then I speak academic. Yeah, uh, but when I go to a to a farmers assembly, yeah, I speak farmers language, and it's not a problem. I mean, it's you know, I'm not I'm not uh, advocating an ideology. I'm I'm talking about facts. I'm talking about impact. I'm talking about health. I'm talking about you know income, about economy. Yeah, linked to ecology, yes. But but you know that's that's it's not that I need to fake any messages. It's just the way, uh, let's say, the level of detailedness and the level of how many numbers do you put in that how many yeah to get your, meta, your message that? across yeah what you need yeah. to say to get the message across okay yeah right. that's that's interesting um still going uh, staying in the, the the green family as a as a political family so you are the, the co-chair of the european greens which is the the europe-wide political party that gathers all the green parties across europe it's different from uh, the green efa group which only gathers the the green meps in the european parliament so 
since the European Greens, uh, so the party, uh, is not involved in legislative work in the Parliament, what what is actually what is it actually doing? What what is the European Party doing? What is it for? First of all, in the group, we also have pirates. We have the European Free Alliance, which is the regionalists. We have people from Bolt. We have, even have people from Die Partei, you know, the, the, the satiric mm -hmm. party. So we're like a bigger and diverse group in the European Parliament. The European Green Party, our main job is to, to, to uh, make sure that we're coherent across Europe. So we're actually debating positions uh, on policies, on topics uh, with, within our councils. We're having extensive uh, uh, processes on formulating our resolutions, which basically give the, the topical fundament of our political work across the European Union. And it's main uh, ingredient to be coherent because i mean you need to know what the others say to be coherent huh? uh, this is the first thing and the second thing is that what we do is that we spread know-how we spread knowledge we spread campaign uh, uh, wisdom uh, into countries that have not yet uh, built on strong green parties so we're extending our scope we're supporting upcoming green movements uh, or not always only green movements also like progressive leftish green minded ones that are not called greens and maybe will never be called greens we have many parties as a member of the green family that are they do not have green in their name but it's about what they stand for what they uh, um, what they um, uh, campaign on and so on so so we put in the moment we put a lot of effort into building green parties in the south and east that, that's, uh, that's uh, actually the question i wanted to ask uh, the the geographical uh, differences in Europe between the Green parties. We know that the Greens are strong in uh, in the north of Europe, in Germany uh, uh, mainly, but it's also weaker uh, in in the east, also in the south. How do you explain this this difference, this electoral difference? Uh, why some uh, why the Greens are strong in some countries and not in the, in others? If you see the history of green parties, we all grew organically. So like we grew and we built substance and we grew a little bit more. And then we we prove we have proven that we can also govern on the local level and then we grow again. And so this kind of slow but sustainable growth uh, has started much later in the former Eastern European countries than it has started in the former Western European countries. So that party building period was, was later. Uh, and then in many Eastern European countries, but that also counts for the south, uh, the level of income is much lower than in the center, center of Europe and in the north. So the people are much more struggling to actually feed their kids on a daily basis and to pay their rent and their energy bills. And if you like work your ass off every day from morning to evening, there's not much time to actually think about the broader picture or think about the bigger questions of life. Uh, and that also, I think, is one reason why it, it took some time actually to, to build green parties uh, and to get this engagement going. And very much to the south also, uh, it's, it's also that that environmental questions, uh, but that also counts for the east, are only kind of getting uh, a priority for citizens uh, in the last, let's say, decade, uh, more and more, and slowly and slowly in the East, also more and more. Uh, and, and, and so there is more and more kind of need also for green parties. And maybe last but not least, we're actually improving substantially as well in the East as in the South, because I think time is right. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's true. It, make, it makes sense that uh, uh, if you if you're if you're struggling to 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 get a job to uh, to to feed your family, your your priorities are are more immediate uh, than the 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 the, uh, the 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 ideas that we usually hear from from, from the greens. Uh, since, as you said, the, the greens initially came from uh, urban educated uh, population, etc. So there, there is. A, uh, an economic logic, so, so to say, even if that the, the fact that the eastern country and the southern country are catching up to the north and the center, it uh, logically speaking, it means that uh, the, the greens are, uh, have started to grow now. Um, okay, uh, moving on from, from the politics and uh, uh, going back a bit uh, to, to, to what you think. Uh, 
um, so you know that uh, these days uh, we're talking a lot about uh, uh, the future of Europe, what to change, etc., uh, etc. Et so on uh, uh, last Sunday, uh, so on the 9th of May, uh, there was the official launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is supposed to be this uh, this huge bottom up uh, bottom up uh, exercise where citizens are supposed to, to to say what they want from the EU, what they would like to change from, uh, for, from the EU. It's a process that will last until next year. Uh, what do you think about this whole conference and what do you, would you like to see coming out of it? I think it's the right thing to do to talk about the future of Europe and to also see where the sectors are, where we should work closer together. Uh, and I mean, due to the pandemic, uh, some disadvantages of the current structure became super obvious. I mean, if we're not even able to cooperate in a, in a pandemic with who locks down when and which documents work where and which rules count how, yeah, and that closing borders, and I don't know what, this was a huge failure actually of the European Union. And there it's clear that we need to uh, build a, a better cooperation and, and a deeper cooperation. I also think also in terms of election rate, we need to look into stuff like transnational lists. So we have real European elections because up to now, most of the European elections in the na national states are more about national uh, topics rather than European topics. And I think it would be good to have also transnational lists where actually citizens can elect a spitzing candidate and the one that wins the race because president of the commission because in the moment the, the constitution of the commission is completely undemocratic yeah or uh, not completely because the governments also have been elected no not the governments actually the parliaments that were supporting the governments were elected and the governments then elect the commission but you know it's like twice around the corner mm. and we need if we want european citizens to identify also with their political representatives well we need to allow them to also cast some direct votes but on the process of this future of Europe, I am really worried that that story is doomed to fail. Because how do you want to involve citizens on a broad basis discussing something like the future of Europe? I mean, if I only sum up all the topics that should be talked about or could be talked about, we're sitting here in an, another two hours. Yeah. Yeah. But then we didn't talk content. We just talked about what we should talk about. And do you want to do this in one year? I wouldn't raise too much expectations because that's going to be a huge disappointment, I feel. All right, uh, that's pretty clear. Um, and again, speaking of change, if, if you had three wishes uh, to change something about the EU, what would you change and why? Taxation minimum taxation for companies stop that fraud you know i mean every single worker every farmer every professor at the university is paying their taxes they're paying their share most of the small and medium-sized companies they are paying their share and some of them have a hard time because they pay a lot and the ones that are super wealthy and the ones that grab more and more of our profits are just escaping across the ocean or into some some tax havens yeah actually cheating the whole society and it's not a question whether it's us or eu well they're cheating all of us yeah they're not paying taxes anywhere and i think that kind of systematic failure needs to be solved as soon as possible so stop unanimity in taxation do a minimum taxation and make sure really everyone pays their share uh, because that that other ways uh, that system is going to implode earlier or later Second, Europe also needs to take some global responsibility because we're co-responsible for a lot of problems that we have left in the world. Uh, it's due to our past, but it's also due to our uh, trade policy. I talked about foreign policy, weapon trade, whatever. Yeah, And we need to take responsibility, especially in times where, where our way of life, you know, democracy, value-based, uh, juridical uh, rule of law systems and so on, but especially the rule of democracy, of demos, of all of you out there, this is massively encountered by China, by Russia. You know, China is running around saying, look how we solve 
solve the crisis. And look how the idiot uh, Europeans are still suffering. Yeah? Uh, you know, we, we really need to lead or at least take a responsible role in uniting democracies in the world and defending that rule of citizens against autocrats uh, and, and, and dictators. And that's, I think, very, very key. And last but very much not least, if we're not solving climate crisis, we don't need to talk about a lot of details, a lot of policies. We owe that to our next generations. And if we fail to, to stop global warming, our grandchildren and grand-grandchildren will actually will make us responsibility for the failure. We're messing up their future. All right. And I'm coming up to, to what has become a, a classic question, uh, the, the, the standard question on, on, from the stream. Uh, do you support a federal European Union? Yes. Not surprising, coming for a green, but I had to ask, otherwise my chat is going to, go, is going to give me hell. Um, so that's, that's very uh, uh, clear. I'm just reading through the chat to see if I've missed a, a few questions. Uh, and actually, since we have a bit of time, we can come back to, to a couple of more questions on agricultural policy. I mean, that's your favorite topic and the, and the chat seems to, seem to like it, so why not? Uh, so... Uh, we, we had a, a question, for, actually a remark following a question from Endless London. So he's saying, we have seen the largest farmer protest in India this past year. How is EU farming rules different or better? Uh, if there is food shortage due to those protests, is the EU going to be affected as well? Well, uh, the Indian agriculture is still very small structure. So there's still a lot of like very small enterprises. Uh, these farmers uh, have, we, we have lost them many, many years ago. So that the changes in structure uh, are, are uh, have, have moved much, much more forward in, in the European Union. But also we have farmers protests regularly, even in Brussels, you know, where we, we see trackers every two, oh, yes. three years. Uh, blocking whatever yeah so so farmers protests at least you know farmers very often are people with a certain self-esteem you know they, they're they're kind of they're proud on people their feet, yeah and they're, they're sometimes also tough people but i respect them a lot because they they're ready to drive their tracker into town and really voice their concerns so so uh, i think uh, these this is not so much different from india to here and in terms of farming, in terms of farming rules, do you consider that uh, the EU is more advanced uh, than, than in India? For well, I, advanced I think uh, as a way, as a manner of speaking, of course, but. Uh... I think we're just very, very wealthy and we can afford to support the farming sectors with billions of euros. Uh, unfortunately for the wrong production method, but still uh, that's not something India is can afford and is doing. So their farmers uh, were put uh, directly under the pressure of the world market uh, in, the, in the last two centuries, uh, uh, which caused like enormous amounts of suicides uh, um, of farmers that were not able to pay back the debt uh, because they were pushed into GMO plantations and using pesticides and artificial fertilizers and they, the crops they were harvesting never paid off uh, and so they, they ended up in debt. So it's a, it's a very dire situation for, for Indian farmers and that's why uh, we see the protests uh, in that like size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and another question from from Little Miss Derry, following up on the on this whole debate about about trade, about food production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so she was asking, what about countries that cannot grow agri food products in sufficient quantity, quantity so they have to rely on trade? Uh, how do you how do you ensure food safety in these cases? No, no, I'm I'm, I'm not against trade. You know, it's, it's, trade is a good thing to have. Uh, but we need to reflect on what do we need to trade and what do we not need to trade. You know, I, I mean, like, let's take beef. I, I, I mean, I, the question on meat eating is another one. Yeah, but, but let's take beef. Europe produces more than 100% of its own meat. So why do I need to import 100,000 tons from Mercosur countries? Why? I mean, you can still import, you know, if some people want to, I don't know, are keen on eating Argentine meat, uh, which by far has not the quality anymore that it used to have 30, 40 years ago, because they changed their production methods. Yeah? 
that, that, that's okay. Well, then you pay the price for it and you have an Argentine steak, if you think so. But like in general terms, it makes sense to eat the stuff that grows in front of our own door rather than sending it once across the planet. Uh, so we need to reflect the useful part of trade and we need to reflect the fair and equal on, on eye level, you know, the, the equal uh, fair uh, um, relations. Uh, and, and also on, on, on trade with food, I mean, maybe to the Middle East. Well, the Middle East cannot sustain its own population with food. And, and sure, it's okay to, to, to have global trade. I'm not against that. I'm just against uh, spending billions of taxpayers' money, of European taxpayers' money for, for a part of yeah participation on on a wealth market that is 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 destroying our fundamentals of production all right and i mean you you've been criticizing uh uh agriculture not agriculture but the, the big farmers the 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 the, the agro you know, the agro food industry uh but i think i mean Speaking of trade, uh, they, I think you would agree with them uh, on Mercosur because they've been quite critical about uh, uh, about Mercosur. So Mercosur, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the South American bloc of countries. There is a, uh, a trade agreement that uh, that has been uh, concluded on paper that needs now to be to be approved. Uh, or is, has it been approved? No, I'm, I'm lost with all this trade trade, trade, trade agreement. I'm, lo I'm lost. Uh, yeah, it has been it has been approved. Uh, but there, there was a, a lot of protest from the, the agricultural sector because they say that uh, there there would be unfair competition from the the, 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 the South American production because they are, they don't have the same standards. They are, uh, and that would be unfair competition to the to 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 the, the European farmers. So I suppose you would agree with the, with this that trade in this in this specific case is dangerous for for european farmers i imagine well, that's, that's just a part of the concerns and it's a very specific course, one sir. and luckily mercosur is not uh, approved yet uh, it still yeah. needs to go through the council it still needs to go to the, through the european parliament and i believe it still needs to be ratified by all uh, european state parliaments so the battle is not over and i think we can still win it and yes the concerns of the farming sector uh, I support them because, I mean, sure, we cannot raise uh, the, the, the production standards further and further and further within Europe and still allowing free trade imports that are not meeting these standards by far. Uh, that concern I, I share. But my bigger concern is on, on the, way, the, the way these countries are treating international treaties like a Bolsonaro uh, government in, in Brazil, they don't give a shit about international agreements. They sign them, but they don't fulfill them. They actually do the opposite, you know? I mean, there he's he was encouraging illegal loggers to go into the Amazon and to burn it down, granting them uh, uh, f freedom of, of prosecution, yeah? Uh, you know, as long as countries like Brazil and others are chopping down the Amazon forest, and by that increasing the danger of climate collapse, uh, and, and they're not respecting the Paris Agreement, which they have signed. Uh, how does anybody think that uh, non-binding nice words in such a Mercosur agreement, which can which cannot be enforced on, on, on environmental questions, on climate questions, will anyhow work? You know, and also on, on social issues, on, on human rights issues, we, we, especially Brazil, but also Argentina. We've got huge landlords still from the colonist times. I'm not talking about a thousand hectares or ten thousand hectares. I'm talking about farms with hundreds of thousands of hectares, yeah? landlords that basically own the country, that have their own paramilitary armies that are chasing farmers away from their soil, that are hunting landless people, that are providing jobs. It's not jobs, you know, it's like close to slavery uh, conditions. You know, why, why should we fuel that? And with even bigger imports of, of soy and beef, yeah, but for soy and beef, the Amazon forest is chopped down and burned down. So how can we do a, a climate policy within Europe really aiming to make Europe CO2 neutral at a certain stage and at the same time do a free trade agreement that is just fueling the problem. This is a complete contradiction. And that's why I think that kind of trade agreement is just ready for the bin. And still on trade agreement, I have Icaros in the chat that is asking about your take on the uh, the EU-China investment agreement that is also uh, a big topic uh, and that is now, for now, de facto defunct uh, 
dead in the water because the China decided to to sanction uh, uh, a number of uh, of MEPs actually in, uh, among other people. So. First of all, it was a very anti-democratic procedure between France and Germany to decide on negotiating that. Second of all, the agreement is bad because the Chinese are selling stuff to us, like advantages which they have sold to us twice already and they have not met uh, their, 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 their requirements and what they have signed up on. Yeah? Like, like they would allow uh, European investors that invest more than 1 billion euros. So guess who that is? Yeah. So for medium-sized enterprises, that's completely useless. And then I don't even need to rely on their uh, their sanctions on on, on, on Euro European parliamentarians and so on. Uh, but I just look what happens with the Uyghurs. Just look what happens in Hong Kong. Yeah. I mean, th there is international contracts that grant Hong Kong democratic freedom for another dozens of years and China just doesn't care. Just look what happens with Taiwan, you know, they're under constant threat of being conquered by the Chinese army. Look what how aggressive China acts in the South Chinese Sea against their neighbors. Just that, you know, all that social credit system within the country. OK, that may be an internal affair, but only that is enough reasoning why we should not engage even in deeper integration and, and investments, uh, uh, investment securing uh, contracts. We're having some of those already, like take the Energy Charter Treaty, which is preventing countries to change their energy production system because they are threatened uh, by, by court cases uh, from companies that are losing their, uh, their, their expected profits of the next 10 years or so. Yeah? So I think that agreement is, is, I mean, it would have been a huge trap, but luckily it's off the table to the super aggressive uh, and super anti-democratic behavior of the Chinese government. All right, that's that's pretty clear as well, and I think that um, it's uh, it's been an odd topic. And so far, I am yet to meet uh, someone who defends the, uh, the 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 China uh, China agreement. Uh, and I, I genuinely looked for some, for people to try who are defending it, but I never found anyone. Yeah, um, Hungarian MVP. True. True, because today uh, we learned that uh, Hungary actually blocked in council declarations against uh, against China because China has been uh, at this practice of i don't want to say buy the loyalty but to invest heavily in the in infrastructure in some countries we've seen that in greece with the uh with the the the, the biggest port of the country that has been literally bought by china there we've seen a big investment in uh, in hungary in czech republic if i'm not mistaken as well uh so yeah Ch Ch china has been investing big in there and that's also what triggered a bit uh, the uh, uh, the worries about uh, the EU, at least some member states, uh, about that. Uh, I don't see any more questions in chat, and it's been already an hour. So what I will uh, I will ask you, Mr. Vates, is to uh, I will give you the last words. Uh, so say the la your last words to, to to the to the to the audience, and then you'll be able to 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 f uh, to enjoy the rest of your evening while we stay here and discuss uh, the the rest for a few minutes more. Thank you for inviting me again. I like your format, actually, and, and to all the listeners, thank you very much for being interested in what we do uh, at the European level. Uh, that's that's very welcome uh, for me. Uh, thanks a lot for listening and asking very interesting questions. I, I, I really appreciate that kind of conversation. See you in another occasion. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vates, for taking the time to answer our question tonight. Chat, uh, make sure to thank him and to check him out uh, on his social media. You see his Twitter angle on uh, just under the the, uh, the video feed. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, I wish you a good evening, uh, Mr. Vates, uh, and I hope you will have the occasion to see you on the stream uh, at a later point. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Uh, so, uh, what did you think of the interview? So, uh, I saw a few comments uh, during the during the, the, the uh, during the uh, the discussion. Some people say, "Oh, at last, uh, someone uh, spicy uh, coming on uh, 
uh, on the same industry. The, 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 uh, the uh, interview was spicy with someone who is very uh, convinced of his point, and that's good. That's uh, that's uh, that's what he, uh, he is here for, uh, and that gives us like a uh, strong opinions. Uh, and I know that uh, Little Miss Derrick was not agreeing with him uh, in a, uh, was not agreeing with him, which which is fine. Uh, Blast is saying that he is so emotional, though. I would not say he was emotional. He was, he was very, yeah, he was very convinced of, of his point. Uh, but yeah, he, he was not too em emotional. Uh, the Belgrim bomb E2, a uh, bit E2 off guard, uh, Icarus. Yeah, so the, but actually that's a, that's, that's a good, uh, a good point. Actually, I was, uh, I was wanting to, 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 to cover that as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, here we, we went back to, to a more, uh, classic uh, kind of uh, kind of green uh, MEP. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to find this. I, I don't want to say aggressive because he was not aggressive. He was assertive. He was assertive about uh, about his point. Uh, like uh, like Mr. Miss Derry is uh, saying right now in chat. Uh, you you could feel his NGO background. He's very much uh, militant about what he think, which is which is fine. Again, huh? it's uh, it's not an issue and. Um, but it was interesting also that uh, at the be uh, at some point during the conversation he was saying that well, he had to make this transition uh, between his NGO practices and then going in the parliament uh, where he had to work on policy and it's not he had to to do things that are not communication. Um, and indeed, that's something that uh, that takes a, a bit uh, getting used to. Uh, like I was saying that there is NGO PTSD in the bubble. I, I don't think there is NGO PTSD because I mean there, there are so many NGOs everywhere all the time in Brussels. We we're pretty much uh, used to it. Uh, uh, maybe some are, are terrified by the by the uh, by NGO campaigns that uh, that can be a bit over the top, uh, truth be told. But uh, yeah, I, I would not say that there is a PTSD uh, in, in the bubble. Uh, so going back to, to, to the different remarks, things that I noted on my, on my little piece of paper uh, that you can't see, but that I'm waving now in front of the of the screen. Uh, I've seen Icarus. Icarus thought I, I didn't see that in the chat uh, about the common agricultural policy. That uh, it's basically about giving money to friends for uh, for for the French farmers. To an extent, that was true because uh, it's true that uh, it's going to be story time because actually uh, the, the the common agricultural policy is indeed a, a big French request. It was created initially for France to pay for the uh, for the French farmers because well, uh, it's not it's not exactly a surprise. The the, the French farming sector was the biggest and is still uh, the biggest uh, the, the biggest agricultural sector in Europe. Uh, and it led to to quite epic fights uh, in uh, in Europe, where literally France in the in the 60s uh, decided to not attend any kind of council meeting until they got their way on the uh, uh, on the on the, the, the cultural agricultural policy. Uh, I think it, it lasted for a year until the until the other country gave up and, and gave the French what they wanted on the uh, on the agricultural policy. And it was for the very long time the by far the biggest uh, budget of the EU. I mean, at some point it was 60% of the budget uh, uh, alone. Now it's more clo it's closer to, to, to 30, 35%, but it's still one of the biggest policy uh, for, for, for Europe. But uh, indeed, a lot of money goes to, uh, goes, goes to France, even if it's not as much as, uh, as before. But uh, I can say that he would never dare to tease French political interest or if only I could believe you, but that's fine. Again, uh, something that he that he, he said I, I thought was a bit exaggerated, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when we were he was still, we were talking about foreign policy and how uh, basically the EU contributes to uh, to war by uh, uh, through its trade agreement, where he says that the, the trade agreement that the EU is uh, is uh, is concluding are so unfair that they they are causing conflict and war. That's <clears throat> I mean I, I can hear the argument about trade having an economic impact, but I would not go as far as to say that, uh, oh, sorry, <clears throat> I'm, I'm dying right now, <clears throat> I'm back alive, uh, I would not say that uh, EU trade policy is causing war uh, in the world, uh, far from it, uh, I would say that the uh, uh, in many cases, the, the EU trade policy, trade, the trade agreements, especially now, are uh, probably the most fair out there uh, 
compared to, to other big, uh, big trade powers. Uh, Icarus wants me dead and turned into a zombie, that, that's fine, I deserve it, but... Uh, yeah, then again, he, he was very, uh, very strong, very uh, assertive on trade. I know that Lim Little Miss Derry was, uh, uh, was not very happy about that. Uh, yeah, she, she found his argument uh, quite contradictory. Um, no, don't worry, Blast. Don't, no need to call uh, 112. Uh, I'm, I'm alive. I'm alive and well. I, I recovered. Uh, but yeah, he, he was quite assertive on trade. I, I don't agree with him. Uh, uh, as well, uh, I think it's a bit exaggerated. Uh, something he was, he will, I agree with him, however, and that, that is historically true. It was about the uh, uh, the defense point when he was talking about uh, the Balkan Wars, uh, where he said it was a, a European failure, and that is fact. Uh, the, the Balkan Wars is a European failure because we literally had a war at our doors and we couldn't do anything until, well, uh, the US had to show up and, uh, uh, and bomb the shit out of Serbia and, uh, and, uh, and all that to, to solve the situation. You know, not only Serbia, but uh, again, involving uh, in, in the Balkan Wars. Uh, so yeah, indeed, that was not the highest uh, 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 mark, all mark of, of the EU on that. And it was definitely a, a, a big failure for us, which fed into the uh, the the all uh, the all movement to increase the power of the uh, uh, of the EU or the, at least the coordination not the power because I, I don't think uh, there is actually a lot of power uh, for the EU in foreign policy uh, for, for many different reasons but uh, indeed that's uh, historically speaking he, he was right uh, on the EU army uh, personally I, I find I mean it's it's a classic we they, they, everyone always ask about the EU army, uh, I, it's a classic, but I, I, I don't see a EU army happening anytime soon, nor do I think it would be exactly a good idea, I mean, how would you even make it work, I mean, that's, that's, that's just, uh, from a practical point of view, I, I, I don't see uh, exactly what, how it would work, I mean, we already have the, uh, what we call the Euro, uh, uh, European battle group, so it's supposed to be, uh, uh, battle groups that are formerly like parts of the French, uh, the German, then uh, all the European armies that are bended together for, for a bit, uh, supposedly to, 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 to be uh, on call if the EU ever needed it, but I mean, nobody ever deployed the battle, the battle group, the European battle groups, it's just here for sure to say that, uh, oh, we have a, a defense policy, we have a battle group, but I mean, in practice, it, it's, it's useless. The defense policy is led by the member states, uh, and I don't see how the EU uh, could or should uh, uh, dive into that. Uh, and I mean, especially since there, then it, it triggers a lot of uh, strong reaction. I mean, we, you remember the, the Brexit campaign where everyone was saying, "Oh, the, there will be the EU army if we stay in the uh, if we stay there." Uh, Ikaro was saying that the Euroco is a great great bunch of people that can raise the Strasbourg flag. Yeah, exactly. That's that's pretty much the only thing that they do. Well, not only the only thing, but yeah, that's. Uh, they're not exactly uh, a lot of boots on the ground uh, with the EU flag. Uh, Little Miss Derry saying, uh, he said that the Indian farmers are too small and haven't restructured yet. And then he said he's against big pharma. There didn't seem to be a middle point. Um, true, I mean, uh, you, could, you could hear that he, he was not a, a big fan of, uh, of big farmers. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I, see, I see your point uh, about the, the, the possible contradiction in his, uh, in his approach. Um, moving on to the next point of my list. Oh, yes. Yeah, so interestingly, so uh, as you know, I told during the during the stream, the on Sunday, there was the official launch of the conference on the future of Europe. So this big exercise, the bottom up exercise where citizens, you and I, can pitch in and say, oh, what would we want the EU to, to, to do? And he actually said that it was probably doomed to fail and that he didn't want to, to, to build expectations on that, uh, which is, I don't want to say surprising, but uh, until now we have always heard MEPs being very supportive of that, yeah, it's a good initiative, etc., etc. But uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, uh, I agree to an extent with him because uh, so he, he mentioned the fact that the process was too short because it's only going to be one year. Uh, initially, it was supposed to be 
two years and a half, but then COVID happened. Uh, and of course, that, uh, that made things slower. And then on top of that, in a typical EU fashion, there was a whole internal fight on who's going to be the big chief uh, of the conference between uh, the parliament, between commission, the council, etc. So it took a year, another year to find an agreement on some kind of structure that makes absolutely no sense and everyone is president of something. So it's it's utterly ridiculous. That's typical, uh, typical EU nonsense there, uh, I have to admit. And they did, uh, after losing one year, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't bother to, to change the deadline. Uh, probably for political reasons, I would imagine, uh, if I was a bit cynical. Um, but yeah, the problem is that, I mean, I, I think I've mentioned that before, the, the, the problem is that, uh, and that's the key of the conflict on that between the council and the parliament, uh, because uh, on the one end, the parliament wants to pro parliament, so uh, a lot of MP want to say, oh yeah, everything is on the table, and, uh, uh, citizens can change everything if they want, and the council says, yeah, well, no, you can't change everything, we don't, uh, we don't want treaty changes because that's, and it's to the prerogative of the member state, and it's a, it's a nightmare. Whenever you open treaties, it's a nightmare, and you have no guarantee that uh, it's going to succeed, uh, that the, the, the public opinion is gonna, are going to support it. So the, the council was very, very, very reluctant to any kind of uh, uh, ideas uh, that, uh, that will lead to treaty change, or that would suggest treaty change, because the, the, the council would say no, and people would get frustrated. So that's... Uh, that's pretty much the uh, the difficulty with uh, with the Conference of Future of Europe, uh, and I agree with him on that. Is that you you risk you risk risk having the whole thing backfiring by promising too much and not being able to to, to deliver what you actually promised. Uh, so on that, I agree that it's uh, it's difficult, and uh, uh, I have I have to admit I haven't uh, I just went to the on the on the EU portal for that just to. One one time when it was released, like a, a couple of year, a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't been there, but I'm not sure it's uh, exactly the most simple tool to to use, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people uh, uh, have no idea there. And Ikaro is saying that it could be easily hijacked by Eurosceptics. Uh, and actually, I, I, someone was saying I, I don't remember who, but someone was saying that actually they had to remove thousands of contribution because it was indeed hijacked by a lot of Eurosceptics that were like uh, spamming the the uh, spamming the platform with uh, uh, anti-EU anti uh, things. Uh, I mean, not that it's forbidden to be anti-EU, but it was obviously something that uh, that was not genuine. So they had to 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 remove a lot of messages. Uh, Blast saying that traditionally the EU has a problem managing expectation. Yeah, exactly. It's either all or nothing. Uh, yeah, Post of Europe was talking uh, about it in uh, Meet uh, Meet EU, so yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be a problem. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 Covid year would that be unironically the best year for a conference of the future of, of Europe? Uh, yeah, you, that could have been the case. The problem is that we, the, the, we didn't have the structure, so we didn't know how it was supposed to work. And uh, 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 it would have been the perfect year, yes and no, because there have been the good years for people who are. Uh, tech savvy, you know, who are comfortable to go on on the internet to use the platform to do these things, and uh, uh, many people are not are not that keen or not that uh, uh, comfortable with that. So that's why it's important as well to to have physical uh, meetings to allow older generational people who are not keen on doing that this sort of thing. So it would have been. Good for a certain part of the population, but not for 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 everyone. But in any case. The structure was not there, so it was it was simply not uh, possible uh, to do that. Uh, and finally, yeah, on China, uh, it was on fire, uh, rightfully so, uh, I would say. And uh, this uh, this deal is is pretty much dead in the water. Uh, I'm I kind of disagree with him saying that it was a, a all big plot of the of the French and the German. I mean, the, the other member states approved of it. Uh, definitely, the. the uh, the Germans uh, pushed this deal very hard because the German companies and notably the uh, uh, the uh, automobile industry is very much implanted in the, uh, implanted in in China and they, they 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 would very much welcome the protection of their investments. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's I would not say that it was a plot from the French and the German to to push that through. Uh, the, the other member states uh, 
definitely uh, agreed to that, uh, even if I think it suits everyone that now the, this thing is getting killed. Um, Little Miss Derry is saying, uh, we have something else that you noted back on the agriculture side. Uh, farmers are famously older, so less understanding of digitizing too, so apps or drones are difficult to implement. True. That's true, and uh, I mean, that's something I, I very briefly mentioned. One of the key problems in farming today is that, uh, A, we have less and less farmers, but we have less and less young farmers uh and that's that's a big issue uh so uh if you don't have farmers uh, well whether uh, whether big or small you you're gonna have a problem uh that's that's for sure um and yeah, as you say uh, many farmers today are older so not necessarily uh, uh into the, the the big tech uh, kind of uh, kind of tools uh and using drones and this kind of this kind of thing so I agree that implementation of that, uh, I mean, it's fine in, in countries like uh, the Netherlands or uh, or even France for that, for that matter. For that matter, I, I would be doubtful whether it would be manageable uh, in, in the Far East or uh, Far East, in, the, in Eastern Europe, uh, for, for, for instance. Uh, but, well, uh, let's see. Did I have anything else uh, on my little piece of paper? I think I covered uh, most of it. Um, did you guys uh, notice anything or any remarks, things that you you, uh, you like, you didn't like about uh, about his interview, about what he said, uh, additional information, or or all on that? Uh, I know that Little Mystery was very frustrated uh, about that. Uh, I mean, I, at some point, uh, uh, I, I'm happy you didn't react it, but when he said, oh, who, who dares to, to, to say that in chat? I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Poor Little Mystery getting, uh, getting attacked for, for asking a question. <laughs> uh, Icarus was, was happy. It was a good interview. Yeah, it was spicy, like spiciness. Um... But okay, uh, let me check, uh, going back to, to, to my conclusion, because I think we, we can wrap up at, at this point. Uh, we, we don't have a, an obligation to do half an hour, uh, and it's, it's time to go. Uh, so I hope you, you enjoyed the interview. Uh, he was happy about it. He liked the format. That's perfect. Don't hesitate, as usual, to give me feedback uh, on this call or on Twitter. The, the, links, the links are in my bio. As usual, next week uh, we are going south uh, with an interview with Italian MEP Brando Benife from the Socialist Group. However, and that's the important part, uh, the interview will not be on Tuesday as usual, but on Friday at 6, p uh, 6 p.m. Uh, Brussels time. Why Friday? Uh, because next week is the plenary week, so usually it's, it's more complicated for MEPs to be free in the evening. So next Friday, six o'clock, uh, interview with Brendo Benefe. Um, was a good interview, but agriculture is close to your art and it's very frustrating. Often left these comments from the green. Yeah, it's usually explosive, uh, explosive uh, topics whenever we're talking uh, about this. Uh, I mean, he was assertive. Uh, that, that's part of the game. And uh, I mean, we'll, one day we'll try to, to have uh, people who have different uh, opinion. So, as always, uh, I've liked, uh, I enjoyed the interview. Uh, don't for those of you who are new with us tonight, uh, don't hesitate to follow me here on Twitter and on Discord. Uh, it always helps the channel. The links in the are in the in the bio. And on this note, I thank you all again for being here tonight, uh, and I will wish you all a good night and see you next week. Have a good end of the week, guys. Bye.